I'm delighted to say my Mark Meets guest tonight is Rupert Lowe. Hi, Rupert. Good evening, Mark. Pleasure to be on your show. Uh, great to have you on the show. One of the country's most high profile entrepreneurs. What the hell were you thinking getting into football? Well, it happened really by default. You couldn't have made it up, actually. Um, I was, uh, as you say, you, you forgot one part of my education, which was the Dragon School in Oxford, which, uh, as you say, I'm an Oxford boy. That's, uh, that's probably uh, that's my, my favourite part of my education. I love the Dragon School. Unfortunately, it's gone a bit woke, like, uh, like a lot of educational establishments these days. But in those days, it was, it was fantastic. So football, um, I mean, I was in the city, as you quite rightly say, for quite a long time. I worked for uh, worthy names like um, Bering Securities, uh, Morgan Grenfell, uh, Phillips and Drew, uh, and, I, and I was a commodity broker at the outset. I started actually in insurance, in Lloyd's Insurance, so I've done quite a lot of things in the city. And people say I had a retirement home, but I didn't actually have a retirement home business. What happened is I... I rescued Secure Retirement, and we got it a listing on the stock market. And when I left Morgan Grenfell, um, I went and worked at uh, Secure Retirement, and we ended up doing a reverse takeover of Southampton Football Club. We were going to make it a retirement-related business, but in the end, uh, we widened our search to leisure, and somebody brought us Southampton Football Club. So we ended up doing a reverse takeover, the logic being that we brought management and money and a listing. Uh, and obviously, they were at the Dell, which was only 15,500 seats. Uh, they'd been struggling with relegation, uh, but avoided it for some time. But they were always sort of in the mixer at the end of the season and had some wonderful ups and downs, which I enjoyed my first season uh, after I took over. Uh, we built St. Mary's, as you say. Uh, but I think the proudest achievement for me was building the academy. I, I, um, I took a personal interest in the academy. Uh, I, I, I loved developing young uh, English players because England being uh, basically a footballing country, it's not the UK, it's England, and Scotland is a, is a, is a different footballing jurisdiction. So I loved the academy and we produced some fantastic players, uh, you know, like you know, Walcott, Bale, Oxlade, Chamberlain, Luke, Luke Shaw, uh, Adam Lallana, you know, the list just goes on and on. At, at and, one point, um, Gareth Bale. At one point, Gareth Bale was the most valuable football player on the planet, and he came through your academy. He came through our Bath Centre, yeah. And um, I think one's got to give credit to the staff. We we actually changed the staff because, in my view, a lot of uh, English staff are actually uh, incredible. They weren't as good as some of the foreigners. If you look at the uh, if you look at the structure in Norway, the academy structure, or France, it was much better than ours. So I think a man called Georges Prost uh, deserves a lot of uh, the credit, along with Malcolm Elias, Hugh Jennings, and uh, our scouting and uh, academy management team. Uh, we bought a, a hotel in Southampton so that they were properly uh, looked after. Their education was taken care of. So I, I think you can't win anything unless you create good people and you employ good people. And, you know, a lot of our boys have been a, a credit to the game. I think Theo Walcott's been a, an incredible credit. Gareth Bale, too, uh, as well as being tremendous athletes. They're clever and they're great footballers. So uh, that was, I think that's the most, other than getting to the cup final in 03, as you say, that was my, I think, my greatest achievement in football. I, I, I think football, tragically, is quite a corrupt industry. And, um, I'm almost as sure as I can be that a lot of, uh, uh, you know, spin was, was targeted at me because once we started to do very well in the academy and in the first team, uh, you know, I think there are a lot of agents, a lot of big clubs, a lot of the industry who makes money out of big transfers. They don't make a lot of money out of, uh, out of simply, uh, you know, young players doing very well. So I've fought, as you probably know, uh, two libel trials, which I won. I've had my phones hacked. Uh, I mean, it's quite a dirty industry, and I think it's, um, it's a great pity because we have the best raw material in terms of our talent and our people. And if we had a better structured industry, I think we could win the World Cup on a very regular basis. But um, sadly, uh, a lot of people in the industry put profit uh, before they do uh, actually the success of English football. 
And Rupert, you became a very high po profile public figure. As you said, you were, you were perhaps targeted by some bad actors. But, but also, of course, uh, sometimes you, you felt some heat from the Saints fans. That's the nature of football. Uh, was that an uncomfortable role, your public role? Because hitherto you, you hadn't been on a, on, a, on a sort of platform, a public stage like that. Well, I don't think football is for a shrinking violet, Mark. I mean, I mean, the, probably the best story I, I had from my early days was uh, when I when I I actually was going to become chairman and did become chairman of the holding company, not the football club. And then a wonderful man called Guy Askham, who I worked with, uh, we were going to be relegated my first season, and the Saints didn't ever have a chairman who played sport. Well, I I actually played quite a lot of football at the Dragon School. Hockey, uh, I was a two-year colour at my, at my uh, public school, and then I played quite a lot of hockey at uh, the Lansdowne Hockey Club in Cheltenham. So I, I, I was a reasonably good hockey player, striker, knew the way around, knew the way around to you know, the box, sometimes good strikers stand still, sometimes they move. So I, I managed to play a part in keeping us up that first year. And then the second year, I hired Dave Jones because Graham Souness left, uh, and... We were doing very badly. I think we had one point from the first 10 games of the season. And the joke going around was, what's the difference between Southampton and a cocktail stick? And the answer is a cocktail stick's got two points. So there was a, there was a game There was a game we played against Leeds United. We lost 2-0 at the Dell. And shortly before the end of the game, the chant from the Saints fans was, Rupert Lowe is a W-A-N-K-E-R. So I assured my wife it wasn't true who was sitting next to me. And I also um, went to a dinner party that night and I, I was there with Chuck O'Brien and I, and, and, and I said to him, Brian, I don't really understand uh, what's going on. I've done my bit. I've kept the Saints in the league. I've hired a new uh, a manager. I actually prefer to call them head coaches because not many of them can manage, but head coach is a better, a better name for them. Uh, and I said... They're all there, 15,500 of them were chanting, Rupert Lowe's a W-N-K-E-R. So he took a moment to reply, lifted up his wine glass, uh, and he said, he looked at me, and he said, well, I suppose you've got to look at it this way, Rupert. 15,500 people can't all be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so so that, was, that, was the, that was the sort of, um, that was my baptism. And as I say, I'm pretty sure there was some malign... Uh, forces being uh, railed against us because that's how the big clubs control football. They control it by through the media, uh, through the journalists, uh, and, and, and obviously through the agents who uh, often get into the players. So, I, I, look, I, I, have, I had a great time. I love sport. I love being involved in football. I was involved in the Premier League. Uh, I was involved in Wembley National Stadium. Obviously, we, we did a lot of financing of the new stadium. And got, as you say, we got got to the cup final in 03. Uh, we lost 1 0 to Arsenal, but look, it was a great game. And I, uh, I, I Rupert, thought they always the get lucky. Game. Sorry? The Arsenal always get lucky. The Arsenal got a bit lucky that day. Uh, Brett Ormrod should have scored, but he didn't. So uh, anyway, we, we, we went home having had a wonderful run. And I think. That was an evening on which all the Saints fans were, were happy and had a good time. Sadly, not at Wembley, but um, we, we went to Cardiff instead. Well, Rupert, my chairman, Daniel Levy, will tell you that it's a thankless task being a visionary chairman. And uh, you have to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune and a bit of abuse along the way. But your legacy is clear. Southampton FC is back in the Premier League in that magnificent stadium the amazing academy and that long, rich history. Long may it continue. Um, briefly, let's power through some questions. I mean, just before we get to Boris and Brexit and your political career, I would have thought one of the most important jobs of the chairman is the selection, the recruitment of the right manager. And you've worked with Harry Redknapp, Glenn Hoddle and, and many others. So what makes for a good football manager in your view? What were you looking for when you were club chairman? Well, I, I think the key relationship in a football club is the relationship between the chairman and either the head coach or the manager, whichever whichever name you want to give them. And the key the key to the success is that the chairman has the power to choose that 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 person. 
So I had some a great relationship with Dave Jones until uh, he was uh, wrongly uh, taken by the CPS, the Crown Prosecution Service, to trial, which again uh, was was an, an injustice to Dave. Uh, I hired Glenn Hoddle. Glenn was one of the most professional people I I, I knew in football. He planned everything. Uh, he he cared deeply. He was a great coach, and he inspired his players. They respected him. Uh, Gordon Strachan, fantastic human being, enjoyed working with him. At the end, uh, you know, I I really would have reappointed Glenn Hoddle, but because my phones were being hacked by the British media, who seem to think it's okay to sit in judgment on everybody else while they're while they're basically hacking people's phones to get stories. Um, they leaked this this uh, reappointment of, of, of Glenn, and curiously, a lot of the fans uh, were up in arms. It's very different if it's been leaked and people object to appointing somebody and announcing it when people have to accept it. So again, that was knocked off course. And once Glenn knew, because that that media split the board, and in the end, the, the Harry Redknapp appointment and the appointments post that weren't my appointments, and probably. If I'd seen my time again, I should have stepped down when the board split and was undecided on what it should do. Because again, you can't have a split board in football. You can't have little pockets of of negativity in the corner of the boardroom. You have to all be in it together and you have to have a united boardroom uh, with uh, somebody who you feel comfortable working with. So oh, I, well, I, forgive I, again, my oversight, but I didn't realise you weren't at the helm when Harry joined. Of course, that appointment didn't work out brilliantly. Well, was, he went, he went, to, he went to my uh, director's rival club, Jake, uh, who's in my ear tonight, a big uh, Portsmouth fan. That wasn't a good look from Harry, was it, going from Southampton to Portsmouth, especially when he left Southampton saying he wanted a break from the game? Well, he went from Portsmouth to Southampton, and then I think he went back to Portsmouth again. Yeah, that was so, it. So, you know, the odds came in on on the betting markets and, you know, nobody would, could have made it up, really. And off Harry went later to uh, Milan Mandrick again. So, I, I again, this is, you know, this is... I, I, I Harry is a good human being. And, in fact, Fergal O'Brien trains his horses on my farm now, so he's enjoying tremendous success. And would you believe it that Harry has a share in a horse up there? So, literally, at the top of the hill uh, is Harry's horse. So, um I hope he'll come and drop in for a cup of tea one day. But Harry was Harry was not somebody I I think I would have picked uh, as my first choice. Uh, the board really had a had a hand in that, and as I say, arguably it should be the chairman who picks who he works with because it's that's the key relationship in the club. Well said. Well, the clock's against us. We could talk to you for hours, Rupert. Brilliant question from Aid on email, who asks. What drove you into politics, Rupert, and would you do it again? What was the experience like? You were, of course, a Brexit Party MEP and uh, a keen Brexiteer and a very proactive member of the Vote Leave campaign in 2016. So uh, why did you enter politics? Well, I'll, that's a good question. I, I, I think I became fixated with the, the post-war uh, reconstruction of Europe and the the sort of establishment's dislike of the nation state. And I studied what had been happening and fought long and hard against the Maastricht Treaty. And then I realized that um, that actually the key to our sovereignty was to maintain the pound. And when Sir James Goldsmith uh, stood up uh, and put up 50 million pounds, uh, formed the referendum party, uh, I, was, I, I was absolutely uh, intent to join. I stood in the Cotswolds and I kept my deposit. I got 6.75% uh, of the vote uh, and kept my deposit, sent it back to James Goldsmith. And that probably is one of my proudest political achievements is we kept, if you remember all three parties, we had um, Paddy Ashdown, uh, Tony Blair and John Major. They were all pro the euro because the establishment at that time were all pro the euro. They will deny it now, but that's the truth. Uh, and all the same arguments were being run about joining the euro as of being, you know, about Brexit. So um, ultimately, Sir James Goldsmith elicited a, a promise from all three parties that they would have a referendum before we surrendered to the euro. So uh, the common misapprehension is that Gordon Brown played a part in that, but actually he came after Sir James Goldsmith and the promises that were made were made uh, in 1997. So when Cameron called the election, it was in, in fulfilment of that promise that was made uh, by, 
to, to Sir James Goldsmith, effectively, at the time of the referendum party. So I then did a lot for business for Sterling. I then did a lot for Vote Leave, as you said earlier. Uh, and ultimately, well, again, great night was, was that night in uh, June 2016 when we, we won uh, the, the, the vote. The British people voted to uh, leave the European Union. We then had this terribly frustrating period when Theresa May, who I, I just found her the most frustrating, ineffective uh, prime minister I, I think I've, I've, I've ever witnessed. So I got very frustrated and that prompted me to, to ring up Nigel and Nigel asked me to stand in the West Midlands, which I did. Uh, my wife got a little upset with me because I didn't have time to even discuss it with her. And the next thing I, I, I knew, I was speaking to 1,200 people in various parts of the West Midlands. Uh, and if you remember, I then was going to stand as an MP in Dudley North, which is one of the most Eurosceptic uh, constituencies in, in, in the country. But at the time, I stood down uh, just before, and, and Nigel got cross because the message hadn't got through to him that I had actually informed the party. But I took the view I didn't want to split the vote and let in a girl called Melanie Dudley, as it was, who was a momentum-supporting Labour candidate. I have to say, uh, I, I helped a man called Marco Longhi win for the Tories by stepping down, and slightly disappointed he never actually uh, made contact and thanked me for, 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 for what I did. But um, look, the, the real politic of, of, of Tory power is there for everybody to see, and um, they're quite arrogant, uh, I think, in, 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 in as much as they've been in power for such a long time. Uh, so answer to the question, why did I go into politics? Because I wanted to save the pound and, and through that, the British nation state, which I see as incredibly important to accountable government in this country. Well, I've always thought that Brexit is the ultimate insurance policy against being a member of the euro. Look, we've only got a couple of seconds to go, well, Rupert. Euro uh, euro very must, briefly, rapid fire, if we can. Um, so many viewers with so many questions. You've been a top boss, very briefly. You've been a top boss. Would you hire Boris Johnson for your organisation? No, uh, I, I wouldn't, uh, is, the, is, the, is the short answer to that. I, I think... Um, Westminster is is now not fit for purpose. I think the civil service that reports to Westminster is is, is even less fit for purpose. Uh, but changing it all is incredibly difficult. And I think um, it's going to be very difficult to get the kind of government that we need in this country if the, the pure ability of the British people is to be released again and the benefits of Brexit are to, to actually uh, flow through.